All right, it is 1101. Uh, we've got some participants already registered that are viewing us. In the meantime, we're going to go ahead and move forward. For anybody who comes in a little bit late, this presentation is being recorded and we'll make it available at the lafarge.ca website. We'll also have it available for those of you that are internal attendees. We'll make sure that this is uh, available on our intranet. Our three guests that we have presenting with us today are Bill Gowdy. He is a member of the Lafarge Canada team and the Environment and Public Affairs Manager for Northern Alberta. We've got Carrie Macklin coming in from Clear Results, which provides strategic energy management. And we've got Priyanka Lloyd with Green Economy Canada, who provide another framework and strategic approach to reducing our energy consumption in all industries. Um, I am just here as your host. I'm Jill Truscott, Manager of Communications in Western Canada, and I'll be in the background making sure that our recording works properly. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Bill. He'll introduce himself and the rest of the team. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer them throughout the presentation. If there's anything outstanding, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Bill, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide there, uh, please, Jill. Okay, uh, Jill has already introduced the three of us. Um, I um, basically I've I've engaged uh, Carrie and Priyanka um, with some of the strategic energy and management initiatives we have. We certainly can't uh, do this on our own. Um, I've got multiple jobs uh, within Lafarge, um, and it's there's a lot of different balls in the air. So energy is just certainly one part of it. Next slide, please. So my area, we've got 45 operations uh, in northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan. So there's ready mix operations, asphalt plants, pipe plants, precast plants. There's a whole group of different operations. Um, the long and short of it is I'm not embedded in any of these operations. So I'm really dependent on everybody uh, to carry through the initiative. So it's really up to the workers that are actually in the plants themselves. They're critical to all this. So I do absolutely nothing except maybe function as a bit of a, a cheerleader. And we provide a little bit of education for them as well, but it really comes down to the operations. Um, I'll ask uh, Priyanka and, and uh, uh, Carrie to also uh, give a little bit of background on some of what they do with their organizations. Sure, thanks, Bill. Um, so I'm Priyanka Lloyd. I'm the Executive Director at Green Economy Canada. We are a national nonprofit um, that I am based out of and headquartered in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, and our uh, sort of reason for being is wanting to kind of align purpose and profits and help uh, lots of organizations, um, you know, have thriving businesses while also making sure that we have a healthy livable planet for generations to come. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here today to share more about our experience working with other organizations across the country. Carrie? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I'm Carrie Macklin. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Energy Management with Clear Result. Uh, we are an energy efficiency company, so we um, help organizations implement energy efficiency programs. And one of those programs is the Strategic Energy Management Program that um, Bill has been a part of in, um, in Alberta. So I'm excited to talk about the theory behind strategic energy management and how um, you know, energy can be a manageable cost and also really um, highlight the success that Lafarge has had in Canada and just the um, amazing reduction that they've seen through this program. So happy to be here. So what we'll walk you through today is um, a number of ideas on how you can potentially reduce your energy consumption. Uh, this involves raising awareness among employees, conducting energy scan to, scans of the operation. Uh, it, it involves coaching and training. Uh, what we focused on for our particular group is low cost, no cost measures. So primarily habits. We didn't really look at much in terms of capital items. It's really key to provide feedback uh, to the people that you're working with. Um, if you don't close that loop, that's, that's where the big issue really uh, gains momentum uh, for us. It's really, really important. It's also important to promote those successes uh, with your operations. That's how you keep the momentum going. And today we've got uh, Carrie and Priyanka here. And the big reason uh, for that is we really require these outside resources to help us along. This isn't necessarily our area of expertise. So if we can draw on 
other groups, that really is what gave us the, the pop uh, in what we were trying to do. And then lastly, we'll touch on just a couple of capital projects that we're just starting. So we'll sort of walk you through our journey. Uh, it, it hasn't been going on very long. So where we started, what we did, how we got the message out to our employees, getting their buy-in and closing the loop. So how we evaluated uh, our, the results of what we did in terms of our projects and trying to keep that momentum going. So just as a general background in terms of the amount of energy we use, this is sort of to put it into context of, of how much we'll use. So this is a couple of the plants that we have, um, a few ready mix plants and a precast plant. So typically we'll be on the order of about 20 to 30,000 gigajoules of natural gas a year and about 800,000 to maybe 1.3 million kilowatt hours of electricity at a facility. Now for our people at, uh, at operations, it's sometimes a little hard for them to relate to a gigajoule or a kilowatt hour, um, but this is something they seem to connect with. So we just reframe the question for them. Um, we use a lot of alternative energy sources at, at Lafarge for fuel. Um, this is one that we've told them that we've been using. So that seems to resonate with them a little more so to get their buy-in, uh, especially with their accountants. So the steps we took, we joined Edmonton Corporate Climate Leaders in 2018, and we complete, completed our first energy baseline uh, with uh, Climate Smart in, in 2018 and the Corporate Climate Leaders. So we joined a few other organizations as well. So we're getting multiple avenues of, of push. So Energy Efficiency Alberta had a program that we signed up as well for in 2019. And Clear Result was actually the, the group that Energy Efficiency Alberta engaged on this program. So that's how we first connected with, with uh, Gary's group here. So we formed two energy teams, uh, Petroway and Winterburn, which is basically the east side of Edmonton and the west side of Edmonton. And we weren't quite sure where or how to start in terms of a goal or, or how we do. So we threw a number out there of 2%. Let's, let's see if we can do that. You're never quite sure where the programs are going to go. Is it going to sort of fall off the table? So that's where we started with our goal. We uh, went out, we conducted a number of um, energy audits at the facilities. Uh, with our operations people, uh, with the people of Clear Result, uh, their engineers uh, joining us along, just going through the plants, identifying possible places where we could conserve. So we developed a whole list of conservation measures, and then we developed timelines to uh, address those various issues. And then closing the loop, we, we connect back with our, our groups, or our teams, to see how we did with those on, on a quarterly basis. So I'll let Carrie walk us through some of the um, uh, uh, SEM uh, program and some of the things that are done with that. Yeah, thanks, Bill. So the program that Bill is referring to, we call Strategic Energy Management. Um, and it's, it's really a, a program that is designed to help organizations save energy through low, no cost type measures and create a culture of energy efficiency within um, organizations, commercial industrial facilities. Um, so we started, um, and I, and in, in a couple of slides, I, I actually have some specifics around the program in Alberta, but Bill and, and Lafarge was, were part of a couple of cohorts that we ran and what we call cohorts are really just a group of organizations that are going to be going through this process at the same time. It tends to create a, um, community within uh, within the geography and um, and also um, helps people understand each other and learn from each other and, and maybe create a little bit of coopetition, if you will, um, you know, who can save the most kind of thing. So we, we recruit these cohorts um, in different ge um, geographies, so ge geographic regions. And that's kind of the first step. Um, and then the next step is to ensure that there's executive sponsorship and um, identify that energy champion. So Bill being the energy champion at Lafarge, when we talked to, um, to that group, we made sure that there was leadership um, 
uh, commitment to uh, to that. Um, and and Bill, I don't know, did you guys have a different champion at each of your facilities? Is that how you guys um, we, set that up? Uh, we had the two cohorts, so we had two two energy champions in total, one for for each cohort. And and would you be the executive sponsor in this case then? Uh, no, we had outside executive sponsorship in this particular one. Yeah, so um, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of of leadership um, uh, like interest in this, um, and so that's the very first step that we do. We really talk to the organizations, we make sure that there's um, that there's buy-in, um, and that we set up that energy champion. Um, and then this is my SEM snail. I call him Sammy. Um, but this is the continuous improvement, uh, the continuous improvement process that we go through. That energy scan that Bill was referring to, that's one of the first things that we do. We want to make sure that the organizations have a good list of opportunities in front of them so that they're never wondering, like, what should we do next? We spend um, a lot of time helping them prioritize those that list um, and understand what's going to be easy to implement at their facility. Um, and then we help them create a, um, or we create, I guess, an energy model that tracks savings for them. And so one of the things that Bill mentioned was the feedback. And the feedback is, is most important <clears throat> um, by showing them the difference that energy or that the actions taken by the teams um, we're able to accomplish. So showing that savings is really important, which means those models of the facilities that show the energy savings is important. So we create that so that they can do that feedback loop. Um, that register of projects is, uh, like I said, important, and we're continuously improving that by, by looking at it, honing it, uh, prioritizing it, and, um, and updating it. So it's really a, a living document. Um, and then just like any continuous improvement process, we evaluate, report, educate, and celebrate success. And so Lafarge had so, um, so much success and it was really something that we enjoyed celebrating with them. Um, the, the program itself actually has three mechanisms that we use. Oh, sorry, almost done. Um, collaborative group workshops, one-on-one -on -one coaching and technical services. So those collaborative group workshops, so Bill and the um, other other um, organizations in that cohort will get together. Um, now it's virtual, but uh, before it was in person um, and get together and learn from each other and talk to each other. So that's how we try to create that community. Um, so hopefully that set up the program and kind of how it works and Bill can can keep going on, on that. I don't know how to change the slide, sorry. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so we, um, Carrie's talked about this. We had very much a, a shotgun approach. We came at it from several different angles. Uh, we, we generated a bunch of general measures, but we also had measures that were specific in, in individual plants. Uh, and the big thing for us was really the habits and the attitudes through the whole organization, trying to get those down. I, this is what was really an absolute shock to me. So we joined the program March of 2019. Shortly after that, the turning point for me was, believe it or not, on, you can, I can actually uh, call up a specific date, April the 8th, 2019. Um, I weaseled my way into a, a meeting for our supervisors, our frontline supervisors. They do a startup at, at the start of the year. We have two seasons in Alberta. We have winter and construction. So we they were getting ready for the construction season. So we talked to all of the supervisors at that time. And this might sound really peculiar, but the one thing we actually did was actually showed them the bills um, at their operations. So we're a bit of a behemoth of an organization. Um, the problem is our utility bills come in, they go to Toronto, they're actually going to Columbia now and they deal with it there. So the biggest problem is you can't manage what, what you don't measure. Well, we're measuring it, but the actual operations themselves weren't actually seeing the information. So the big thing for us was to turn this around and put it back to the actual operations. And once they saw what their uh, utility requirements were, that they, they did a complete 180 in terms of perspective as to how they manage that. So we, put, we have us as management, we pushed it down to the supervisors, and then we're pyramiding that down to individual workers. So there's 180 supervisors. Well, we've got in excess of 1,000 workers in our area. So every little act of conservation matters. So every little thing they do, we get that pyramiding back up uh, through the system. So it might be very small on its own, but 
all, all together, it really makes a big, big difference. So we put out educational materials to them and messaging. Um, it's really important to repeat that message. I don't know if you watch uh, uh, commercials or, or jingles and you get something stuck in your head and it's because somebody's actually gone through it 20 or 30 times. You hear it once and it really doesn't register, but it, we just keep dripping and dripping and dripping on them. Um, and the message eventually really starts to resonate with them. So here's a couple of examples we've got. There's a sticker uh, that we have. We put it around lights on equipment. So they're smattered all over the place. Uh, here's a keychain in terms of um, uh, idling. Um, and again, it's right in front of them every time they turn the vehicle on. So that message is out there again and again. And then we also put out uh, routine um, newsletters or internal communications through, through jail to our organization. And so what we've developed is what we call the energy treasure hunt. So there's several ways to reduce your energy and your costs. You can do it through uh, capital projects, whether they're big or small. You can do it through improved uh, procurement. What we were focusing on is what we call the energy treasure hunt. What are those day-to-day -day little things that are going on in the operation that are areas of, of waste there? Um, now, Carrie, I don't know if you want to comment on this. This is actually from Clear Result. Um, and this was one of the things that they uh, showed us in one of the seminars that we had with them. Yeah, I mean, the the idea of the treasure hunt, you know, like I said before, is really to try to get that good list of opportunities for the team, um, understanding what actions they can take. Um, and uh, one thing that's unique about the treasure hunts that are done in strategic energy management versus maybe audits that energy audits that had, had been done before is that it really does focus on that operations piece and, and the low and no cost type of opportunities that can be, um, that can be achieved. Um, clearly the other projects, capital projects um, and, and, and bigger improvements are also usually found during that time. Um, although a lot of times the sites already know those, um, but if we do find those, we'll put them on the list, but um, the focus is really on the operations. And so we'll actually talk to the operators and we'll talk to the people in the plant and understand how things are, um, are operating and running so that we can help uh, suggest improvements to reduce energy. Um, I won't necessarily go through all these, but there's, um, as Carrie had mentioned, there's a number of little steps that uh, are identified with that opportunity register. So some of them are, are just things you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of it, you look at them and it's like things you tell your kids to do at home uh, on a routine basis, like turn out the lights. But we had things like conveyors running without material on them, um, uh, lowering pressures on them. Uh, on compressors, so they're not kicking on as often, so they're using less less energy, uh, turning off equipment at nights. Um, the one at the bottom, the block heaters on the truck was a huge one. Uh, we have a massive fleet of ready mix trucks. And again, we have the two seasons, winter and construction. So we still do work in the winter time, but our fleet is quite underutilized in the winter. So block heaters, again, you're plugging those in to keep the engine warm so you can start it, but sometimes our trucks don't run for a couple of months, some of them. So why do you have that plugged in? Um, really, it's not, it's not necessary. So that was a big energy uh, usage that was really not needed. So just bringing that to uh, the attention of the people at the uh, operations really made a big, big difference. Yeah, and again, I think with, with one of those, Bill, right, that's a no cost opportunity for the most part, just education and time. A, a lot of what we did was education and time uh, um, with with the people there. It's it's huge. Yeah. Um, thermostats, just turning them down a couple degrees. Again, it's 30 below here in the winter. Um, we have aggregate piles outside that we have to keep warm for the mix. And again, the steam's raising off those. But does it need to be at this temperature? Can it be a couple degrees lower? Especially when you're sitting at 30 below, like you you don't want to be able to cook a pizza on it or something like that. Does it really need to be that? that warm it's kind of like tim the tool man taylor and uh, more power but you really don't need to use that much so again just turning those things down a little bit made a huge difference uh holes gaps insul just a little bit of insulation again these are all just little things that people notice just walking around the plant um, our coverall structure at the bottom basically it's a, a big tent 
uh, and it's very light inside. Um, so we went in there, the lights are on, and we said, well, let's turn the lights off. And it's like, do you see the difference with the lights on and the lights off? There really wasn't any difference. So we've got that connected now to a sensor that automatically turns them off. So little things like that. Again, all low cost, no cost items. Uh, we put those all on an opportunity that uh, register. So we've put them on a calendar. We've assigned them to people of when they're supposed to be looked at, completed. The, uh, there's three types of items here. Uh, there's the low cost, no cost items. There's educational items. The ones in yellow are actually capital. And we did absolutely none of these whatsoever. So we've identified them as Carrie's mentioned, but we actually didn't invest any money whatsoever in any of the measures that we did. So how do we do? Well, 4th of July, um, we were quite shocked. Uh, we thought we may be able, may be able to uh, drop our energy usage a little bit, but we really had no idea what we were going to be able to do accomplish here. Uh, there we go. Okay. So here's a, a cumulative sum graph uh, of the energy. So what you get is a baseline a couple of years before we actually started our measures here. So it, you, you more or less get this horizontal line of how you're doing before you started the program. Uh, the big heavy dot dash line there is when we actually commenced. And again, that April 2019. So again, we, we signed up with Energy Efficiency Alberta in March of 2019. We pre presented to the supervisors in April of 2019. And you can see the graph drop off dramatically, both in terms of electricity and natural gas. So this is a reduction in usage of both of those. So this is in the energy model that Kerry talked about. Mm -hmm. So incredible drop. Uh, another plant, this is the... Uh, pipe plant and similar we've got that nice little baseline established we started the program at a particular date and again a dramatic decline in the amount of electricity at, at the pipe plant so what did we end up doing uh, well our baseline for our first cohort uh, with Petroway was which is uh, three facilities we're close to 5,000 uh, tons of co2 in one year we managed to reduce that um, 670 tons. So an incredible drop. And again, none of that was capital. It was all habits, totally habits. And that was the part that was shocking. Like, uh, obviously we were sandbagging a little bit on our original target at 2%. You see, we had a reduction of 20% in GHG. So that was over 400,000 kilowatt hours and 8,000 gigajoules of energy in the, on the first cohort. The second cohort was very, very similar, over 5,000 tons of CO2. We knocked that down 670 tons as well. So if you look at the total electricity and natural gas, we're close to half a million kilowatt hours. Uh, if, if you can recall at the start of the presentation, I was saying it's about 800 to 1.3 uh, uh, million kilowatt hours. So the savings alone would actually almost power in an, another full plant. Like it was, it, it's, it's, quite substantial. Yeah, so um, Bill's experience and, and the savings that, um, that, they, that they experienced, I, I will say is exceptional. Um, we, uh, we run uh, strategic energy management programs across Canada. We have um, quite a few of them running at this point. And the average electricity load that's saved is about 4.9, so 5-ish percent. And natural gas saved is about 6.7%. So 20% and 12% is, um, is definitely above average um, for, our, for the savings, which is you know, amazing. It was really quite, uh, quite substantial. Um, we're working with about 420 facilities across Canada right now. So, um, so yeah, I would say, Bill, that you guys are, you know, a gold star, <laughs> gold, gold star company for us in that way. Um, so if, if you look at the aggregate impact of the S SEM programs, um, and again, this is without any capital investment, um, we, we're saving about one, uh, 105 million kWh a year and 6.6 .6 million gigajoules in, in gas. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, really a, 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 um, a substantial impact on, on Canada and the Canadian, um, you know, energy uh, consumption. Um, and I'm going to see if I can control this now. Let's see. 
Uh, okay. So just, and, and to give you a, a sense, that was kind of across Canada, but really looking at the program that Lafarge was part of, the Government of, of Alberta SEM program. Um, so uh, uh, you were part of, let's see, the Edmonton cohort, and then um, one of the one of the other cohorts. I don't remember which one, Bill. Um, so and so those cohorts. If you look at this bar graph, it's giving you the the types of facilities that were part of it. And one of the things that I'd like to point out is that this is good for industrial facilities for sure. Um, you know, industrial facilities have a good culture of continuous improvement. A lot of times, they're used to that kind of efficiency. Um, and, and thinking along those lines, um, especially in their production. Um, and so when you start to talk about energy and continuously improving energy usage, it's just a natural um, kind of uh, you know, part of their organization and they take to it very quickly like Lafarge did. Um, but we're, we also find that in institutional like, like um, you know, hospitals and uh, and schools and those and those types of organizations, and then also commercial organizations take to this type of a program just as much as um, as the industrial sites. So that bar graph that you're seeing kind of shows you the uh, wide variety of facilities that we're working with. There's 57 of them in this current um, uh, Government of Alberta SEM program. Um, and when you look at the overall uh, impact that um, that you know, Lafarge and the other participants have made in the in the year, almost two years that this has been running. It's about 550,000 tons of CO2 savings, and that's lifetime savings. Um, in all of our programs, we find that these savings, even though they're behavioral based, tend to, to last for about five years. That's the amount of time that the savings um, persists, five years plus. So a lifetime savings um, across all of the organizations is about 550,000 tons. And that's that's about 170,000 cars that um, we could take off the, of the road in, in greenhouse gases. So really impactful. Um, in, in the cost of the of this is about two dollars per ton of, of carbon and so if any of you are pretty um, you know are up on how expensive it is to um, uh, to reduce carbon that is a really good cost uh, right because we're looking at very low no cost operational type activities um, across all of these programs about 856 measures were were implemented so Lafarge implemented a number of them as you saw in those pictures um, or on the on the slides. Uh, and the other organizations also stepped up and implemented a lot of measures. Um, and really the education piece and the, and the jobs, um, you know, we estimated about 750 jobs that were created through, created or kept through this program with just the savings and the, and the um, uh, you know, increase in profitability from these, this type of activity. And it, you know, helps, um, you know, create business competitive and upskilling work, the workforce um, as, Bill mentioned there's a lot of training that they did for their or for their folks and that just um, you know I think helps all the way across. Um, let's see. Um, and then Bill, you can talk about the next steps. Okay, so the big thing for us now is just to keep that momentum going. Um, you can it's one thing to do it, but you also have to maintain that. You can revert back to your own ways, so we have to sort of keep nudging our 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 people. Um, so uh, that's, that's certainly uh, very important. So keep that enthusiasm. What we've talked about here is just five plants today. Uh, there was a question that we had uh, come up during the talk. They were wondering about our other facilities um, and other consumers. So I've, I've got 45 operations within my area. This is just a subset of that. So we're kind of on the, on the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we really only looked at about five. So we wanna expand that out to other areas. But if you look at Lafarge on, on the whole, across Canada, we have an excess of 600 operations. So if you can start to expand that out, you can see how the effect is also magnified. If you look at something like a cement plant, cement operations, uh, those are big energy consumers, both in natural gas and electricity. So they, they make a big difference to anything you can reduce at those. So next steps for us, we haven't really, again, done any capital projects. We're just starting to do a couple of small ones. Um, we've got three uh, lighting retrofit projects, um, two that are completed now and one that's in progress right now. Uh, so I've got a little graph on the right-hand side for the pipe plant. 
Uh, so there's a little arrow on that where we uh, undertook the project and you can see that's where the, the lighting switch over took place. So we've got these three little bumps that almost looks like a cardiogram. Um, excuse the COVID analogy, but we've essentially flattened the curve uh, by, uh, by implementing the lighting project. We're, we're also finding that we can get sometimes even under a year payback, uh, but generally they're in a one to two year payback uh, sort of time frame. So if I could pay off my house in two years, I'd be more than happy. So that's to me pretty good. The little blip right there that's down, uh, you can kind of ignore that. That's kind of a, a COVID-19 artifact. That's when there was sort of a little hard shutdown there. So the drop in energy was more related to uh, a hard stop in the operations. Next slide, please. So keeping the momentum. So the big thing is the teamwork and engagement. It really is a group effort. I'm just a cheerleader. I'm not in the operations. It really comes down to the guys in the facility and, and them making all those little differences. And it was great to have them buy into this. If you don't have that buy-in, you're not gonna go anywhere. We continue to try to provide some backup and training for them, give them ideas. It's really important to recognize the successes that they've done. Like I feed the information back to them, show them how they're doing. Um, I view that as my role more than anything else is to track this information and, and feed it back to, to show them how they're doing. And I don't just tell them, I tell the management as well. So to me, it's really important to, to show the senior management what these people have achieved, you're, you're really nothing without them. They, they really are the ones that are making the difference on a project by project basis. So they can be very, very small things. So we promote these as well. This is one example today, um, but we've also had blogs, newsletters, Energy Efficiency Alberta, Climate Smart. I've put out uh, information and I feed that back to our people as well um, to just to give them the recognition for what they've accomplished. They, they've really done some miraculous things. And we keep repeating this message again and again. I've talked about the commercial or jingle, how it resonates with you more if you hear that multiple times. You can say what you want once, but usually it doesn't go very far. You have to repeat that message and then that's when they get the uptake with it. And for us, we find we turn it into a bit of a game. Uh, we make it fun, we taunt them, we guilt them. Uh, it's like, look what the other plant did. You Surely you guys can do this, or I bet you can't do what they're doing over there. And it, it turns into a competition. So a little friendly competition isn't a, a bad thing. But you see what we've had in terms of reductions. Uh, they've been fairly remarkable. The uptake, the engagement um, with all of our staff, uh, it, it doesn't matter if they're a driver, a plant operator, a, a operations manager, general manager, they've, they've all bought into this. And what I find really cool is they know their plants better than anything else. So they're looking around for different ideas, things that we'd never think of. Uh, they understand their operations. So it's like, well, what about this area? Or we should do this. That's, those are things that are great to see. And again, presenting that information to our staff our, and our management is, is really key in keeping that momentum. So next steps for us, again, we think we can get a lot more. We've done a lot with just plain engagement. Like again, all of what I've shown you today is strictly engagement, changing habits as to how they do things. But now we're gonna try to move into a little bit of, of uh, small capital expenditures and target some other things. So it, for us, it's been like pushing a snowball uphill and then we sort of gotten over the crest and now we're heading down the other side and it's getting bigger and bigger and it's growing on its own, swallowing things up. I'm not sure if I'm the reindeer, the rabbit, or the guy in front of the snowball, but it seems like that's where things seem to be going at the moment, but it's great to see. Okay, that's, uh, I'll pass this over to Carrie. Yeah, so, um, yeah, let's see, go to the next slide, I think, I think I can do this. All right, so um, I just, uh, and I'll do this fairly quickly, but I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about why strategic energy management works. Um, it, a lot of times when we we work with organizations, and like I said, it can be a, a wide variety of, of organizations, and why does it work? 
um, just as well with a uh, with a cement plant as it does a um, elementary school. Um, and the reason is that it, you know the the common denominator is people, right? So we're what we are focused on, and what strategic energy management focuses on is the people part of the equation. Um, a lot of times, energy efficiency really focuses on the widgets. It focuses on the equipment, on the changing out of the compressors, um, on the changing out of the HVAC systems. Um, but really, it's the people that push the buttons. It's the ones that push the on and off button that really make the difference. Um, you can have the most efficient equipment. Uh, possible, but if you're running it when you don't need it, um, then you're still wasting energy. And so um, the common denominator here is people. And it's the reason why these um, cohorts work so well, because even though um, the way energy is used at the cement plant um, is not the same as at the elementary school, um, they can still talk to each other and understand the challenges around trying to implement something like this and engaging opportunity, engaging employees and engaging with their people. Um, and so they're able to learn from each other. Um, and energy, a lot of times, is thought of, an, of as an inevitable cost, not as a manageable cost. And so if we can shift the mindset within an organization to create a, the idea that energy is, an, is, uh, is a manageable cost, then usage starts getting reduced just, by, just because you're measuring it and you're reporting on it and you're showing it to everybody. Um, and that feedback is, is really key. Um, and you know, just the last bit that I, um, that I want to talk about is just how important it is to make energy efficiency as easy as possible. So the picture of the candy here is because, um, you know, there's been some psychological studies about, there was a, a study and I don't know exactly which university it came out of, but um, they were studying how much candy somebody would eat. So they'd bring students in and they'd have them um, do like, you know, a whole bunch of math problems and they'd put a candy bowl next to them and they just see how much they would eat. And then they'd move the candy bowl a little bit further and see how much the, the people would eat while they were doing these tasks. And what they found is when you move the candy bowl, just like, just like, you know, a foot away from um, from the person, they eat something like 70% less candy than if it's like literally right next to them. Um, and so in this case, we want energy efficiency to be the close candy bowl. We want it to be as easy as possible, something that you can just you know take all the time and you don't even have to think about it because people um, are inherently um, you know resistant to doing something that is even just like a foot away. It's it makes it that much harder. Um, so when you think about you know what you're asking your people to do in order to reduce energy, things like turn equipment off at the um, you know in breaks and lunches and all that, you have to make sure that it's as easy as possible for them, that they don't have to go out of their way to do it because it reduces the, you know, some people will do it, but it reduces the amount of people that will do it. So, um, you know, part of Bill's job um, and part of the jobs of our energy team is to really look at what, what, what they're asking people to do to reduce energy and, and figure out if it's as easy as possible for those people. Um, and sometimes that means like rearranging where the switches are. Sometimes that means, you know, making sure that it's clear what equipment can be turned off. Um, but just make it as easy as possible for everybody. And then that way they'll eat as much candy as we want them to. Um, I guess in, in this case, the candy is, is a good thing. So um, now I'm going to pass it on to Priyanka to talk yeah. about. Oh, there we go. Thanks so much. Okay. I think I have the, have the controls now. Um, yeah, so much of uh, what Bill and Carrie uh, have been sharing really resonates with our experience at Green Economy Canada. Um, behavioral change, such a powerful way to just not only get some good hard savings, but also change the culture um, of an organization. So uh, very cool. Okay, so uh, in my component of this, I'm just, uh, you know, going to zoom out a little bit. So we've heard from Lafarge's perspective and the, the really uh, great experience that they've had and some of the, the things that they've implemented. I wanted to kind of share uh, through our experience at Green Economy Canada. So we are a national network dedicated to accelerating uh, the business transition to a low carbon economy. Um, and so we do this in three ways. The first is that we launch and grow a network of green economy hubs, which are community-based programs uh, that support businesses to do the kinds of things that Lafarge has been doing with an eye to kind of long-term uh, targets. So what are we trying to get to over the long-term, not just sort of um, short-term projects? How do we keep the momentum going? 
The second is that we share success stories of businesses going green to inspire others to follow suit. And I think we really heard that come through with the importance of internal storytelling and how, um, how powerful it is to be able to share that story. And we certainly see that in our network. The more others hear about these stories, the more they also see what's possible. And the last is that we work collaboratively with policymakers to inform green policies and investments because we know that um, some of these measures do require capital, uh, some of it can be quite costly, and we know that these programs really do make a difference for businesses to be able to prioritize and afford these kinds of um, improvements. So our network consists of uh, seven green economy hubs across Ontario, as well as the City of Edmonton's Corporate Climate Leaders Program that we're, we're managing. There's a provincial hub that's launching in New Brunswick early next year, and our goal is to establish 20 hubs across the country that are really locally based networks of businesses demonstrating that a more sustainable economy is possible. Um, through our green economy hubs, businesses are supported to work on some aspect of these eight sustainable development goals. So currently there are over 300 organizations, all sectors and sizes actively engaged in setting and achieving sustainability targets from small manufacturers to large consulting firms, retailers, brewers, uh, nonprofit organizations, and even two First Nations uh, communities. So to the point that Carrie was making earlier about um, you know, uh, organizations being able to learn from each other, even if they're in different sectors or industries, we certainly see the power of that um, through our network as well, that uh, there are concepts and even some benefits to being able to view sustainability through uh, a different lens and a different context um, that, can you, that you can bring back to your own organization. Um, altogether, these 300 green economy leaders, we call them, have collectively committed to reducing about 180,000 tons of GHGs per year. So this isn't cumulative, this is per year, and have already reduced about 200,000 tons annually. So that's the equivalent of taking about 42,000 cars off the road each year. And through our experience, I think what we have seen uh, time and time again is that this isn't just, in, in terms of engaging in this work, it's not just a net benefit uh, for climate change, for example, but really that there are some bottom line benefits that businesses see in doing this kind of work. Um, and that what used to even be, you know, five years ago, a conversation that was more about trying to convince businesses that this is the right thing to do. It's, you know, become sort of clear as day that this is actually not something that they can uh, ignore anymore. So I wanted to kind of share just a couple of um, quick case studies uh, from our network, uh, you know, to start with just some low cost or, or no cost improvements uh, to, to kind of keep the theme of what we were talking about before, but um, in maybe some different business contexts. So this is Lighting Co. Uh, they provide um, LED lighting to uh, industrial, commercial and architectural clients. And one of the things that we see is really simple, um, uh, like a mindset that organizations ca can have is thinking about right sizing um, equipment uh, that they need, and then choosing the more efficient option when it comes time to replacement. So in this case, a lighting co was about to purchase two trucks for their fleet. And they decided that actually they could purchase two electric vehicles instead, which would be sufficient for what they needed uh, in driving around town. It was the same uh, cost as the trucks and it resulted in about $2,000 saved per year just on fuel and, and reduced maintenance costs. Um, again, one of those things that's really simple for any organization to implement and to the behavioral change kind of training component um, that Carrie spoke to there, uh, something that you know all organizations can be encouraging their employees to adopt as a mindset of, you know, when thinking about whether it's using equipment, replacing equipment, what do we need and, and how do we get, um, you know, the most efficient uh, option. Walker Emulsions provides uh, both wax and asphalt emulsions, uh, emulsions to a variety of industries and municipalities across North America. They wanted to prevent fouling on their heat exchangers due to hard water uh, from, you know, city, the untreated city water. So they installed a water softener and introduced some pretty simple process modifications uh, that reduced the fouling in their heat exchangers. And this was a 70K capital investment that paid itself back in two years. And they found that there was some additional benefits too. So they didn't need as many uh, overtime hours uh, to, to clean these things. Uh, the equipment lasted longer. There was lower maintenance costs and they just produced less waste and energy um, just through something simple like this. And then the last example that I wanted to share here is um, Veriform, which is a steel and metal fabrication company. So in 2006, Paul Rack here, who's the, the CEO of Veriform, uh, with the birth of his daughter, he had just seen um, an inconvenient truth, which really resonated with him. So he was very passionate about climate change and wanted to feel like he could leave his daughter a better future. 
uh, his wife um, is an accountant and a co-owner in the company. Uh, and so as much as, you know, from a values perspective, she was aligned, she needed to make the books balance too. So they needed to figure out a way how to incorporate this, this kind of thinking into their business in a way that made financial sense. Um, a lot of the measures that, that uh, Bill uh, had shared earlier about things Lafarge has done is, is very similar to what Veriform had done, sort of six months, 36 uh, different projects that they could do, low or no cost kind of things, um, ended up accumulating in about a 45k investment, which paid itself back in six months. And that really for Veriform um, helped them, it, it gave them the proof of concept that they needed to look at this in a more substantial way. Fast forward uh, to today, they became carbon neutral in 2016, having actually cut their emissions by 77% and offsetting the rest. They've saved over $2 million um, just from doing this kind of work. They have reduced maintenance costs, uh, interestingly also reduced staff turnover from this kind of work. They're seeing that um, people are coming to their organization because of their sustainability work and asking about what they're doing and how, can they, how they can be a part of it. Uh, and they've seen increased resilience. So when um, the US imposed steel and aluminum tariffs, Paul attributes the survival of his company to embracing the low carbon advantage. So Veriform is a really great example of the kinds of benefits that organizations can get if they really ingrain this work um, deeply into who they are and a core part of how they operate. So I wanted to kind of um, end with just a couple of slides, uh, recapping some of the themes that we, we already heard from Carrie and Bill. It really resonates with uh, a lot of what we hear. So um, this section is called how you, like creating momentum for your sustainability work. And, and really what it is for us are uh, themes and concepts that we've seen as being really important for organizations to build a culture of sustainability um, and maximize the business benefits of taking action. So the first uh, that we see time and time again, absolutely, it's leadership buy-in and the tone from the top. Uh, and there's a quote here from the CEO of Coca-Cola, which says, you know, frankly, the single most important thing in my view is leadership. You've got to have someone who believes in sustainability and that starts with the CEO. But equally important, you need to have an executive leadership team that's committed to this because it can't just be one person. You need to have others in the organization that are reinforcing that message and helping um, employees really understand this too. Um, and it's, you know, I think in the, the press release that was um, put out by Lafarge, there's a quote from uh, Lafarge Olson, CEO, kind of echoing these pieces too, setting that tone from the top in terms of why this is not only personally important, but um, how it's an opportunity for Lafarge Wholesome to be seen as a leader um, in green construction. So the second thing that we see as being really powerful is it can't just be in words, it actually needs to be uh, integrated into the organization in terms of these kinds of commitments and interests. So setting internal and externally communicated targets are also really important to drive this work forward. Um, Lafarge Wilson has committed to a net zero uh, you know, pledge with science-based targets, which is uh, awesome. That's a credible standard, that's ambitious. And so to be able to make that statement publicly is, is really valuable um, as an accountability piece, as a leadership piece. And then the, the key step here next is, you know, how does Lafarge or other organizations, how do they make sure that they're aligning their strategic plans, their annual plans, um, performance uh, goals for employees alongside these targets to make sure that, um, you know, they're continually tracking progress towards these goals and making adjustments. And we saw some of that through um, Carrie's uh, SEM process that um, she noted. The third piece is employee engagement. So employees are the ones that are going to, you know, uh, determine whether you meet your goals or you don't. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, they need to buy into what's happening, understand how they can contribute, and they're going to have the knowledge on the ground for how to make this stuff happen. Um, so one of the key success factors that we see in organizations is actually starting green teams and sustainability committees that um, have representation from across the organization uh, to bring diverse perspectives in and make sure that the stakeholders that are going to be involved in implementation have a voice at the table. Um, encouraging innovative ideas, so not, you know, if do you have a, a mentality of um, trying something um, or does it always, you know, really need to go through quite a rigorous process before people can be free to innovate. Um, and then some of what uh, Carrie and Bill talked about this piece around co-opetition, we absolutely see as being really important too. Um, friendly competition with between employees or between regions can be really powerful. Uh, and then taking the time to celebrate those successes. 
building internal capacity and knowledge. So how are you training your employees to understand um, how their work connects to these kinds of sustainability targets that are being set? Um, do you allow time for employees to build their knowledge and skills in particular areas? Is that encouraged? Um, and then how are you, in terms of how you set up your systems and processes, making it easier for employees to integrate sustainability into their business decisions? And then the last piece that I wanted to just highlight here is um, the third party support and accountability. So Bill, it was great at the up top that you said there that you know, outside resources have been really valuable for Lafarge. We definitely see that in our work too, that third parties um, like Clear Result, like Green Economy Hubs can provide the support direction and accountability to keep organizations motivated and progressing. Um, the transparency is also really important to avoiding greenwash. Um, so organizations can make commitments, they can say that they're doing things, it's so much more powerful when you have an outside force that's there to kind of hold you accountable, set the standards, and then tell your story for you. Um, and then finally, that being a part of a network um, like the Green Economy Canada Network can support that learning and sharing with peers, carrying on to that too as part of that cohort process. Um, we can't do this stuff alone. So I just wanted to kind of end on that note there in terms of that power of a network. Um, there's this uh, proverb here that you all have heard, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. You know, the kinds of social and environmental challenges we face, the reality is that we need to go both fast and go far. And so it's really important that, you know, every organization is looking at um, how they can um, take these, uh, you know, different ways to become more sustainable, really ingrain it into their organization make some commitments um, and figure out how we uh, can join forces, develop partnerships um, and you know, um, lend our voices to the fact that this is important, that businesses can play a leadership role here and that we can work together to make this happen. So I think I just wanna end it there. Um, and I'm happy to relinquish the controls back. Thank you very much. All right, guys, that takes us back to the end of our presentation. Uh, we're just closing in on the one hour mark. So uh, if everybody is content, if we have no more questions coming in right now, we'll make sure that this recording is available for everybody on the lafarge.ca website. If you've got any concerns or questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Carrie, to Priyanka, to Bill, or to myself. We'll do our best to, uh, to get you connected with the resources that you need to find out how you can reduce your energy consumption at your site and uh, get your teams on board to be a part of implementing that solution. Thanks again, everybody. Hope, hope you all stay safe as we get through this weird time and we wish you all the very best this weekend. Thanks. Bye, thank you. Bye.